my historic England. I got it right. That's yeah, a very yeah, good yeah. I'm very proud. Historic England. I'm going to say it's something like historic England, just in case you hadn't already got the message. There is our lovely new logo, uh, and it's a thing of fantasticness. Uh, and this is one of the first public airings of Historic England. This conference, Steve spoke yesterday, various other, there's lots of colleagues here. It's really, really exciting for all of us, those of you who haven't seen any of us from Historic England so far. So, first of all, proud day for us all. Welcome to everyone to this session. This session came about because of a lot of partnership working, which is the best possible way to start any session at the CEPA conference. Uh, some time ago, a number of us in what was then English Heritage uh, started talking to colleagues, um, former colleagues and current colleagues in uh, local authorities, particularly to Algeo, to talk about this issue, how we deal with a better understanding of what national important sites actually look like. Uh, we then actually ended up having a, a formal board set up with representatives from Algeo, so we're really, really excited to have them involved, and from DCMS, our crucial partner, obviously. But today we've got speakers from a number of different local authorities, from a number of different contractors, who helped undertake the pilot projects from Historic Scotland and from the CEPA itself. So that's a tremendous range of folk. The possibility of recognising national importance has long been recognised and there is the formal position of it inside the MPPF and I think Deborah is going to talk about that in a minute. Um, the whole issue though is that while recognising that possibility, where we can actually take this and what that means, the practicalities of it, is quite another issue. It's a consequence Historic England is always keen to provide better clarity, to provide greater guidance and support to local authorities. Many of us come from the local authority background, Deborah and myself amongst a number of us. So we genuinely have this desire and understanding to, to help those at, at that coal place. This is part of a much larger package of work on archaeology in general, however, that Historic England is undertaking. And many of you are familiar with that work. Uh, my colleague Jill Grayson is here and a number of other colleagues from Heritage Data Management that crucial relationship with historic environment records and provision of data standards and guidance and data provision and sharing is another side. Uh, Steve Tro's department in Historic England does an extraordinary array of work on research uh, in, in, across the country which also feeds into this. And if I'm going to mention two departments of Historic England, it would be wrong not to mention the fact that obviously National Planning Department, um, directed by Chris Smith, is another cornerstone to providing that continuity of support to local authorities from the organisation. So the name may have changed, but I think we'll agree the continued range of things that we want to work with you on gets ever better and bigger and more interesting. Um, I will conclude by just a reminder, we are in the government perda period. Uh, therefore, I would say to everyone, uh, don't feel constrained about what you say, but bear that in mind, particularly for those of us who work inside uh, Historic England and other arms length bodies. Uh, this is a discussion amongst peers upon a topic of mutual interest. Uh, I'm going to have to labour point a bit and say, this isn't a formal policy position. This does not make commitments by Her Majesty's government or any of her bodies towards anywhere we might go. Now, that sounds a bit overladen, but we do need to make that clear, particularly since this is being recorded. Uh, don't go and say six months from now, but you promised this in that session. We didn't. We're not. We hope to continue on to do lots of exciting things, but this is primarily about reporting back from an existing project and seeing ideas and commonalities and links that we can do. At that point, it sounds a bit scary, I'll shut up, but thank you for your time. A reminder to you all, though, uh, who are actually presenting, I will be your ruthless session chair, keeping you to time, but I will be nice to you and buy you drinks afterwards in the bar. So please keep the time, because there are a lot of speakers and we do want time for discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Deborah. Thank you. Right. Just get the technology to work. Good morning. Um, it falls to me to do the somewhat tedious business of um, outlining a brief history of legislation, policy, and guidance around national importance and setting the scene for the discussions and the presentations that we've got this morning. Um, after the inspirational opera yesterday, I did think about trying to set this presentation to music, but um, lacking <laughs> talent, you'll be pleased to know I haven't done. 
Um, and other dramatic forms I thought were a little bit challenging. I couldn't quite work out how to mime national importance. Um, so this is going to be a very conventional presentation, um, but I promise that I'll keep it brief by way of compensation. It's nearly 25 years since the concept that a non-designated nationally important archaeological site had equivalent status to those which were designated was first enshrined in the PPG 16. Despite this, little has been done to formalise the identification of such sites. The pilot projects that we'll hear about today will set out some of the first thoughts and explorations about how this might be done and will speak for themselves. But we thought in preparing this session that it might be quite useful just to remind ourselves of where all of this originates. The 1979 Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act is our starting point. The Act, of course, sets out that the Secretary of State um, is able to designate sites as scheduled ancient monuments. It, in order to be designated, it says that these monuments must be of archaeological, architectural, artistic, historic, or my personal favourite, traditional national importance. The Act also sets certain legal tests for the definition of a monument. Probably the most familiar to most of you will be the requirement that anything that is designated must be a work, as defined by the Act, and I'll touch on that briefly in just a bit. DCMS guidance, most recently updated in 2013, provides further guidance in the definition of national importance and crucially for the discussion today, identifies three key areas where nationally important non-designated sites might be found. The first of these, of course, are sites which have been formally assessed as being of national importance, but which the Secretary of State chooses not to designate. Now, this can be for a variety of reasons, but most commonly, a decision not to designate is based on a on a consideration that a site might be more appropriately managed through another, might be more appropriately or better managed through another <coughs> management regime or indeed through another <coughs> designation regime. The last of these three sites, which are nationally important but which fail to meet some of the legal tests under the Act um, and therefore are incapable of being scheduled, are another element of sites which are considered nationally important but undesignated, or in this case undesignatable. And some of the most familiar examples of those are sites such as the Langdale Axe Factories or Foxgrove, which lack the physical structure required <coughs> to designate. For me though, and I think this is the key area that we're concerned with, the most significant um, area of uh, the most significant group of non-designated sites of national importance are those which have yet to be formally assessed. Of the many thousands of archaeological sites that there are in the United Kingdom or in England, very few of them have gone through a formal assessment process to identify their significance, and many of them quite arguably are of national importance too. The guidance also sets out the non-statutory <coughs> principles of selection which were first articulated in 1983 and later published in PPG 16 in 1990. These are the non-statutory criteria which are used in determining national importance and which formed the starting point for the Monuments Protection Programme scoring system. I just note though that not all of the criteria will necessarily be relevant to every single scheduled monument and indeed, although they are a useful starting point in the assessment of national importance, they by no means replace the professional judgment needed to determine whether or not a site is significant on a national scale. The, now I have to think carefully here, Historic England Designation Selection Guides for Archaeology also provide additional guidance for determining national importance, setting out the specific considerations that we make when we're undertaking an assessment for the purposes of scheduling. 
is again a very broad brush overarching considerations and are help to inform our professional judgment. And examples of the selection guide can be found on the Historic England website. Got two in there. <laughs> Turning to the planning system, the National Planning Policy Framework, and specifically paragraph 139, confirms that non-designated nationally important sites should be given equivalent protection to those which are designated in the, planning, in the planning system. However, colleagues in local government report that they often feel unsupported in, the application, in invoking paragraph 139 and that its application is sometimes unclear. There are differing approaches to defining national importance. In some local authorities, there are lists of archaeological sites that are potentially of national importance. Other local authorities assess potential national importance on an ad hoc basis. And even where lists exist, they are not standardised and the criteria used in forming them aren't necessarily always completely transparent. This lack of common framework means that Often, officer recommendations are sometimes overturned by planning inspectors or dismissed by committees. But let's be honest, these issues are new. There were, we have the same kind of challenges under PPG 16. Mm -hmm. So why are we looking at the issue of nationally important non-designated sites right now? Well, there are various drivers for it. Um, changes to the common agricultural policy and stewardship schemes, for instance, which are focusing much more intensely on designated assets or assets which are clearly of national importance are one of the drivers. And it's unfortunate, actually, that this session is running in parallel to the session that um, is being run on, on the agricultural schemes. Um, Permitted development is another issue, and just as of yesterday, <coughs> Tim has confirmed, there is a new general permitted development order, which um, Tim will touch on later in his presentation. But for me, perhaps the biggest issue is the capacity loss that we're seeing in local authorities. So, what did we do about it? Well. In order to begin to explore the issue of nationally important undesignated sites in planning, the National Importance Programme Board, I seem to have the, the topic with most big words and complicated titles, um, the National Importance Programme Board was formed. Led by the designation department, the board draws its membership from across the sector with representatives from Historic England's National Planning Department, government advice teams, and of course, Algeo and DCMS. The board set out to explore how the concept of national important undesignated sites might be given greater weight and more consistent definition, and to consider whether by formally recognizing some types of sites which currently cannot be scheduled, there was scope in giving them greater protection. In beginning to consider the concept of national importance, the board had no preconceived agenda, and I can't stress that enough. We weren't trying, we weren't starting with an end in mind. It's very much exploration. The pilot projects which were commissioned were invited to offer their thoughts based on experience in a variety of different geographical areas with differing development pressures and local government structures. Throughout the project, we were mindful that any definition of nationally important undesignated sites shouldn't be seen to devalue other non-designated sites, nor to imply that these were not of significance. Moreover, it was recognised that the nature of archaeology is such that at any point in, that any point in time assessment of significance based on available information may change with further evaluation and research. So the board stressed that any identification of national important sites should not imply certainty. The board was also keen that the projects be not be seen to undermine the principle of scheduling, which remains an important mechanism for the protection of the archaeological resource, particularly in the rural environment. And 
In fact, as soon as I finish this, I have to go off and do an emergency scheduling. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the benefits and the next steps in the work that we've been doing? Well, first and foremost, the project has underlined the key role played by local authority archaeology, archaeological services and by the HERs. It has also shown us ways in which we might um, target resources more effectively to deliver the kind of greater benefit and how we can provide greater clarity and consistency in the application of paragraph 139 of the NPPA. We're hopeful too that better articulation of national importance would be influential elsewhere, for instance in the awarding of stewardship and grants. And we feel that the identification of nationally important undesignated sites will help, but not entirely eliminate, in the management of risk for developers. We hope that in partnership with others across the sector, we can agree a protocol and in due course, perhaps, um, begin to move towards guidance for determining national importance, which will support the sector and the planning process. But as Joe said earlier, you know, I would stress we're at a very early stage of this and considerable discussion and consultation is needed before we firm anything up. This session really is therefore a first step in that discussion and um, consultation. The papers will present some of the first thoughts, but we're very much inviting all of you to participate in the discussion and the program going forward as we try and identify how we might be more effective in identifying national importance. Thank you.